Well, number one, I want to thank everybody for coming, especially on a Friday evening. This is delightful. Obviously, I will thank Mr. Langone in a second for giving us his Friday evening. A number of us at the school, particularly uh, Diane Leonard and Adam Brandenberger, who were sitting towards the front, had a great idea with respect to uh, the Langone program in terms of using some of our best graduates and best friends uh, to have a little chat on a Friday evening as a start to an evening. And I agreed, I thought it was an absolutely fantastic idea. Who better than the obvious to be our first guest speaker? We're gonna do this several times during the year, but I couldn't have thought of anybody better than the man in terms of Mr. Langone <laughs> obviously being here. Tell my wife so, that, so that was, that was, uh, <laughs> that was, that was obvious. Uh, this is fun for me because I know Ken Langone for over 25 years. I actually work with him. I used to work with him a lot when I ran investment banking at Credit Suisse First Boston. We share a number of friends in common uh, and we've been together for many, many years uh, on different deals, etc. He's a venture capitalist. He's an investment banker. He obviously is a founder of Home Depot. He is a board member of a number of corporations which we will discuss. He's got a long history with that. He's very much into politics. He obviously is a philanthropist, as you know, from the Langone program, and anybody walking past the hospital, his name's all over the front of it. If you go out to Bucknell, his wife's name is all over several buildings, as is he also. So Kenny is a true believer in giving back, which we'll come back to. I think the best accolade I can give him, and I read many articles about him this afternoon, is, quote, he is a great family man, and we can talk about that also. Ken, thank you for being here with us. Charlie, thanks for having me. I would, add, I would add that every time I did a deal with him, he always bested me. So oh, I don't know about that. Whenever I got a big head, I'd say to the girls, call Charlie so he can screw me again, all right? Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's have some fun. We'll, we'll be here for about an hour, and then we'll adjourn. I'll come to that at the end. We'll have a nice little uh, session after this is over for a few minutes. Can, can I ask one question? Sure, of course. Generic question. How many of you people were here a couple of weeks ago when Stan Druckenmiller and Jeff Canada and I were here on generational theft? Okay, so you... So we're going to talk about that. We'll talk a yeah, lot about that. We're going to talk that. about okay. that. Don't worry. That's one of the items that we Never miss a chance to make a sale when you're a salesman. Let, let's, okay? A lot of these people don't know you the way I do. Go ahead. So let, let's start a little bit towards the beginning to help them. Ken grew up on uh, Long Island, which he is still a resident of. But if you see someone that looks like him driving in his new Jeep, he doesn't know I know that. I would get out of the way since uh, <clears throat> a 78-year-old driving a Jeep as a toy for the first time is a scary thought on the North Shore. Be that as it may, he grew up in a middle-class family. His father was a plumber. And somehow his father was smart enough to instill in him the great thought of education. And he wound up going to Bucknell and then to Wall Street. What motivated you? You could have been a plumber, had a great life, not moved up, et cetera, et cetera, but somehow you saw the light way back well, and changed. I, you know, my mother went to the seventh grade, my father went to the eighth grade, and they, I never remember a day as a young boy that they weren't talking about the importance of education every day. And, and of course, when we think about what's going on in America today, you have to understand that at a family unit, can be a real driver of what people become. And the other thing, very frankly, Charlie, was you, you just elevated me. You said we were a middle class. Um, I think my mother and father were high class in terms of integrity and character and family. Economically, uh, times were tough, very tough. And uh, well, especially when my father was out of work, he was a union plumber. So if the job got completed, he didn't have a job. And, uh, mother worked in a school cafeteria. Uh, by the way, I just came upon, I was going through some of my parents' things this past week. They're dead 25 years, and I just came upon a letter from the woman who was responsible for all the cafeterias in the Roslyn Public Schools to my mother when my mother retired. And of course, I've always been proud of them, but when I read what they wrote about mother and what she did with these kids when they came through the food line, it sort of really gave me a special feeling. But very frankly, one of the things, you know, I've been rich and I've been poor. Rich is better, I'm telling you right now. <laughs> and so, and you know, this relates back to my, by the way, I'm impressed. This is Friday night. When I came here, we were only a night school, but we only had classes Monday through Thursday. We didn't have Friday night right. classes. So I'm impressed that you're all that ambitious and that motivated to 
give up Friday nights as well. But I can remember one night, I had a little apartment. We lived in a little apartment in Flushing on Crocheron Avenue, and we had a one-bedroom apartment, my wife and I. We didn't have children at the time. And the business school, the graduate school, used to be down on Trinity Place. It was an old rickety building that you had to walk up four flights. No windows. Well, no, no, that was Nichols Hall. This was before Nichols Hall. At least Nichols Hall was air-conditioned and heated. In the, in the wintertime, you froze, and in the summertime, you died of, of heat exertion. And they used to have the classes at the Bankers Club. They used to have the classes at the Lawyers Club, all over downtown, yeah. wherever they could get a room. And so anyway, this one night, it was colder than hell. And I used to take the election. I used to come down. At my, I worked at the Equitable Life in their investment department on 39th and Madison. I used to come down, and there was an automat. Horn and hearted automat. None of you would remember what. This is the place where you go in and put a nickel or a dime, and you could get a cup of coffee for a dime. You can get a roll for 15 cents. And I used to get a roll and a cup of coffee, and then go to my classes, and then take the Lex up to the Grand Central and get on the IRT out to Flushing and get off at the end of the line on Main Street and go upstairs. And, and it was not a free transfer. You had to take a bus. And this is when the subway was 15 cents and the bus was 15 cents. Yeah. And I got up out of the subway, and I reached in my pocket. Now, Crocheron Avenue, where we lived, was about four miles from where I got off the subway, and it was a bus ride. I reached in my pocket, and I had a dime. Didn't have 15 cents. And I thought, and I thought, and I thought, and I said, do I ask somebody for a nickel? And my pride just wouldn't let me do that. And I flipped up my collar. I had my briefcase with my bags, and I remember I didn't have a pair of gloves. And so every few minutes, I would switch the bag, and I would put the hand in the overcoat pocket. And then I'd switch it, and I'd put the other hand in the overcoat pocket. And all the way for probably a 45-minute or a 50-minute walk, I, pardon me, my French, uh, I said, God damn it, I ain't going to be poor forever. I'm going to be sure of that. You know, as I said, I've been rich and I've been poor. Rich is better. And when people say to me, well, you know, money isn't everything. I tell them, well, try poverty. It doesn't do very good either. <laughs> so I was motivated to succeed. And, and there's nothing wrong with being rich. Nothing absolutely wrong at all with being rich. You know, I couldn't have given NYU the money I've given them for this school and for the medical center and Bucknell for the athletic center and my wife for the boys club in New York. And how this came up, I don't know. But somebody made a calculation that we've given away at least 10 times what we spent on ourselves in our lives. I couldn't have done that. My father would love to have had his name on a building or had his name on a medical center, but he could barely make ends meet. Mm -hmm. So I'm not apologetic. I'm very, I'm proud of the fact that I won. And I hope I did it legitimately and ethically, and you ought to feel the same way. You're here at night because you want to succeed. You want to win, and it's okay to win. You know, having started out in the 99%, I'm glad I'm in the 1%. But it's the 1% that builds these buildings. It's the 1% that gives the money for scholarships that many of you may get, or may I don't know how many of you get, that you wouldn't be able to come here if you didn't. So if you win, the responsibility is not to be ashamed. The responsibility is to feel good about yourself and then say, what good can I do with what I have? That's your real net worth, okay? So, when to help them in their careers, which mm. obviously they mm. think a lot about, mm. when did you when did you start giving back? When did you realize that was really important, or was that very, ingrained from your parents? Very interesting. Was well, so my first of all, my mother and father, with a little bit they had, they were extremely charitable, very little bit. And you know, the Catholic Church. I'm a devout Roman Catholic. The Catholic Church had a horrible practice. The two big collections were Christmas and Easter. Right. And I was an altar boy. And my father, I think at Christmas, my father would put a half a buck in the Christmas collection. And then the church would print a list of all the people, yeah. how much they gave. And my father was always at the bottom of that list. And, and he was a proud man. And he gave what he could give. And, and for a little bit of history, uh, when my wife and I made the first gift to the medical center, which was about 11 years ago, it was a, a very significant gift, uh, we wanted it anonymously. And in fact, when I gave the first one to the Bucknell, we did it anonymously. Because mm -hmm. I always remember how bad, I knew my old man gave him 50 cents. 
that was a sacrifice. There were people that gave tens and twenties and fifty dollars. I'm sure they didn't give up anything. And so uh, I, was, I saw them and I watched them and I watched their generosity, not only of what they had, but of spirit. And I think it, it, it provoked me to realize that those of us that, are, as I said, if, if Kitty asked me one night, which, which in that worth? And I said, well, I don't know where the hell Forbes gets the numbers from, but I don't know what my net worth is for one superstitious reason. Every time I played poker and I counted my money in from me, I always lost. Right. So <clears throat> since I'm still sitting at the table, I'm not going to count my money because I might lose. But, but, but I remember saying to this kid, look, I, I think if you want to measure my net worth, what good have I done with what I have? That's my net worth. And I believe that. So, you know, it's, I think it's been part. And, then, and I remember one night, the Tuesday night before Thanksgiving, so this had to be 1958. Yes, it was my first semester at the business school at night. And I came out of, I was taking the subway. It was over on, uh, it was on Broadway and, uh, and Wall. That's where the IRT was, entrance. Right. And I was walking in, and there was a guy and he had his hand out, and all I thought about was Thanksgiving, and I gave the guy a buck, which was, since I was making 82.50 a week, you know, you do the math, that's pre-tax. Uh, <laughs> and I'll tell you, I remember that because I, 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 I thought of how good I felt about myself. And you wanna know something? If you really wanna win, you wanna succeed, you gotta start by feeling good about yourself and having self-respect. And I tell people, when I hit them up for whatever cause I'm working on, right now I'm heading up the effort to restore St. Patrick's Cathedral. And, and, I, and I go to people and I say, try it, just try it. Write a nice big check, give me five million, give me 10 million, just see how good you're gonna feel, but you won't feel, you won't feel that way, you won't feel yeah. that way. I have to you tell you, it. when I asked him to do this, I was in his office and he was, and he was doing that to somebody. All right, and, and, and I had to hold, I felt like Dr. Strangelove holding my hand from taking my wallet out because the pitch is so effective. And by the way, it's, you want to win, you have to start by believing in yourself. This is, I think business is more psychological than it is knowing the numbers and balance sheets and income statements and cash flow and EBITDA and all that other stuff. If you want to really win, you got to have a sense of worth about yourself and that you really are somebody special and that you can do it. And if you get knocked down and you fail, and if you got about, if I could be here for the next six months, I can tell you all my failures. I've had a lot of them. But, but if somebody would ask me what, what, what it was, I had the ability to pick myself up and dust myself off and get going again. And I think you'll have that feeling if you reach out and help somebody else. I'm, I've never felt as rich as I felt when I started writing these big checks to charities. All of a sudden, I said, holy smokes, I'm rich. Hmm. You know, a poor guy can't give a, a medical center $100 million in one bite. I did it. And it's in the abstract. What the hell am I going to do with $100 million? Hmm. Think about it. it, it it's, got no, it's, it's a number with a lot of zeros in back of it. It has no real meaning. Kenny, I can be adopted if... Uh... Okay, well... I... <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell me about a failure. Tell me about, tell me about Handy Dan. No, that wasn't a Tell, failure. That was a it was run. a home run, but then everything changed at the end when they well, fired Bernie. Let, let me give you a real failure. <clears throat> and it was probably the low point of my business career. I had the good fortune to bring a guy public by the name of Ross Perot mm. in September of 1968. It was just 45 years. In fact, I called Ross and told him on September the 12th it was the 45th anniversary of him going public. And the thing came out at 16.50, and it probably went to over a year and a half. It went to 165 dollars a share. And we were doing a deal with Perot. He wanted to take over Collins Radio, and we decided to go in and stabilize the market. In other words, support the market for his shares because we were going to do an exchange of shares, and so we wanted to keep his stock from going up and down. And we only, the firm only had was R.W. Press, which wonderful firm, it's still in existence, by the way. By the way, in that underwriting, there were 61 firms in the, in the, in the tombstone. I, I still can't fathom that you beat all the big guys, but someday well, you'll have to tell me that story. Sometimes, every once in a while, the underdog wins. Uh, 
But there were 61 firms in that tombstone. Pressbridge today is the only firm left. Every one of them are gone. Wow. Amazing. Anyway, so I said, guys, I'd go out in the trade room. You got to stand there. You got to take a punch every once in a while. Well, we could take a lot of punches. What we couldn't do was writing checks. And we damn near went broke. And, and uh, I'll tell you a story about a man I have enormous respect for. You may know of him, Alan Schwartz. He was, he was the CEO, CEO. He was the last CEO at Bear Stearns when they put the lights mm -hmm. out. And Alan Schwartz came to work for me. He pitched at the Duke University, and he was going to be a professional baseball player. And he came to work for me, and so we had this horrible hit. We're out of capital. And I'll forget, I remember one day, I got a call from the Chase Bank. They were a primary hit bank. And, uh, the guy's name was Rudy Cusimano, a lovely man, and Bob Stapleton. They called me up and said they had to come see me. And they said, look, the buzz is all around Wall Street that you guys lost $15 million. That was a lot of money there. Yeah. And I said, well, that's impossible. They said, what do you mean? I said, well, because we only had $5 million. I said, <laughs> I said, we lost five and you lost 10. <laughs> and I said, I'll make you one promise. If you leave us alone, We'll get you out of this hole. And we did. We dug ourselves out over two and a half years. They got every nickel back. And, uh, and that was a horrible period. And, and, and it, was, uh, it was a hell of a psychological hit. But as I look back at it, this is one of those episodes, Charlie, where you get some spiritual and some intellectual growth. So that was one time. But uh, then, I, then I banked a guy. Um, oh, I, was, uh, I banked a guy out in San Diego. He had a device to take your temperature electronically. And I went out and I raised $5 million for him in 1969, before the, we hit the wall. Uh -huh. And uh, so a month after I give him the money, uh, he's got 19 guys, all $5 million, and I go out to San Diego to see him. And he takes me to downtown San Diego to show me a parking lot. And I said, what the hell do you want to show me a parking lot for? He said, well, that's where the world headquarters of IVAC is going to be. Mm -hmm. And I thought, gee, it'd be nice if you had some sales first, you know, and some profits. <laughs> he blew all the money. He blew it all. And U.S. Trust was one of the investors, and they called me up, and they said, if you don't go out and try and fix this thing, uh, we'll never do business with you again. So the hell do I know? I start a proxy fight. And don't, you know what, I win the proxy fight. Mm -hmm. So I take over as chairman and CEO and... May of 1962, and I used to leave my office. I was then the president of Pressbridge. I used to leave my office. This is after the hit. We put the money in in 69 and 72. He'd gone through it all. We had the proxy fight, and we won. I used to leave my office at 4 o'clock on a Thursday afternoon. I had three young boys. My oldest son was 12, and they were all in Little League, and they were all in soccer and lacrosse and all those activities. And I used to leave my office at 4 o'clock, and I'd go out to Kennedy Airport. I'd get on an American Airlines flight that would go from New York to Dulles. It would pick up a load of military people and fly nonstop Dulles to San Diego. I'd get off the plane at around 9 o'clock San Diego time, get a rental car, drive up to uh, where the plant was on Sereno Valley Road, work from around 9.30 until 1 o'clock in the morning, drive all the way back down. There were none of those great hotels and motels up by La Jolla. I used to drive all the way back down, get at the hotel around 2 o'clock in the morning. It was the Westgate Plaza Hotel. Mm -hmm. Get up at 5.30, drive back up to the plant, work until noon, drive back to the airport. This is Friday. Get on a PSA flight to L.A. and get on an American Airlines flight 4 and be back in New York Friday night at midnight. And I did that for 90 consecutive Thursdays and Fridays. And uh, uh, I'm glad I did it. We turned it around and... and uh, Eli Lilly had a market cap of $2 billion in 1977, and Eli Lilly bought the company that was, we took it over, was bankrupt. We got 2.5% of Eli Lilly for this company. And I, as a result, because of all the stock that I kept buying, it was a penny stock, I kept buying and buying and buying it. As a result, I am today, they tell me that I'm the largest individual stockholder in Eli Lilly. I'm not bragging, I'm just telling you, you know, what can be. You know, it is what it is. But stay on that. That's one of your philosophies. You, you're uh, like Mr. Buffett. You, you never sell a stock. Bernard Baruch had a wonderful expression. Bernard Baruch, when people asked him how he got rich, he said, I always, I always sold too soon. And my position was I got rich because I never sold. My average holding period today, weighted average, if you take the dollars 
and the value, and you do that times the number of years, my average holding period is 34 years right now. Well, you did, you did well with that orange company called Home Depot. Uh, Would you put two million bucks into that? No, and, no, I, I raised two million. I put 100,000 into it, $100,000, as the biggest investor, and then I got founder shares because Bernie and Arthur and I were the founders. I was never an employee. Bernie and Arthur were employees. I stayed in New York. They wanted to go to Atlanta from LA, and uh, it, it worked out pretty good. I would okay. say so. <laughs> <laughs> That wasn't a bad one from no, your it perspective. Did, it, did, it, did, it did okay, all right? Yeah, that wasn't a bad one from no. your perspective but, at all. Hey, look, it could have been the other way, too. Right. And it has been the other way. And, you know, I think you show your character by the ones you don't win, not by the ones. It's not hard to look good when you win. But when you take a hit, you, you better start thinking about what do I look like. Well, you turn how, one down. Yeah, yeah, how am I behaving? You, you know, am I, am I, do, I, do I rationalize my values? Do I rationalize what's right? because I, I need a break. I, I don't give anybody a pass if they're against the wall and they say, well, I did it, I did this terrible thing because I had my back to the wall. That's nonsense. You know, that's when you show whether you got any guts, any character, any grit. Anyway, go ahead. It's hard to sit in Kenny's office and not uh, realize that he's called about 15 people in the, uh, in the five minutes you've already been in the office, which leads me to ask him the question. Mm -hmm. you, you are the consummate networker. Absolutely. How important is that for them right now in their careers to get that wired and started the right way? You can never be too rich, you can never be too honest, and you can never have too many friends. Okay, it's that simple. And remember, if you wanna have a friend, you gotta be a friend. Just think about that. You know, don't be a convenient friend. Guy comes to you, guy needs a break, and he's a friend, you do it. I'm not talking about become a bank for them. That you want to be careful about that because I've lost more friendships because I've made loans to people than I'm happy to say I did because all of a sudden you don't hear from them anymore and you know they're ducking you and you say, Jesus, bad enough I lost the money, why do I have to lose a friend? But you do lose a friend. But, but um, look, the more people you know, I, I just wrote Hank Greenberg a note today I really got to know Hank Greenberg about seven years ago when I got in the contest with my friend, Mr. Spitzer, who I'm not done with. If anybody knows him, tell, him, name at all tell him I'm not done with him, all right? So you say, <laughs> Elliot, he told over 150 people he's not through with you. Elliot is a gift that never stops giving as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and I can't say enough evil things about him. And, he, and I said to a guy this morning at St. Pat's Cathedral, I said, He's going to keep me from heaven because my, my spiritual belief is that forgiveness is a critical part of being a spiritual person. And I can never forgive him, not for what he, I, he turned me into a household name. He made yep. me a hero. Exactly right. But the lives that he destroyed, the lives that this man destroyed, the companies, he wrecked the biggest, most successful insurance company in the world, AIG. He took a man, an 18 year old kid, who went on the beach June 6, 1944, a Jewish kid whose father had a farm upstate New York, Hank Greenberg, and he built this behemoth from the bottom up. And he drove him out of this company in 2005, right. three years before the war. Hank had a guy sat next to him. Hank knew every single risk in this mammoth organization. And he destroyed that company, destroyed it. And, and anyway, but I, Hank and I got to know each other and I just wrote him a note today, and I'm going to brag. One of the things I'm doing with, with St. Pat's Cathedral is I'm reaching out, not just to Catholics. By the way, 85% of the people that go to St. Pat's Cathedral are not Catholic. Right. It's the third most popular tourist attraction in New York City. And I went to see Hank yesterday, and I said, Hank, it's a hell of a thing for a Christian to come to a Jew and say, help me fix my church. <laughs> And he called me, I, I spoke, he said, we'll, we'll do something. And he called back yesterday afternoon and left the message with this enormous gift they're gonna give us. And, and here's a guy I didn't know seven years. Look, you can never have too many friends. But as I said, if you wanna have a friend, you gotta be a friend. And don't fake it. You know, you know I'll, I'm with you through thick and thin, just don't call me when it's thin. Okay, go ahead. As long as we on, right, we were on one of your favorite human beings there, Mr. Spitzer. What, whatever happened to ethics over your lifetime? It's changed. Not you, but ethics in general. Look, 
Look, um, that bother I'm, you? Sure, it bothers me. Look, I, I come from a world where you put your hand out. I don't need a contract. I'll tell you something remarkable. I have never been sued in my life, and I've never sued anybody in my life. And the number of deals I've done where I sit in a room with a guy and I say, okay, this is the deal, and it's crystal clear, and he says, okay. And he comes back, and he's renegotiating the deal, and I said, stop. Right. What, what do you want it to be? And he says, fine, I want this to be this. I said, fine, I'll do it, but I want you to understand something. I'll never do business with you again. I told my three sons that the most precious thing I can think of in my career is I can't think of anybody I've ever done business with that wouldn't do business with me again. That's the acid test. I've had reasonable and spirited differences with people, but at the end of the day, I always felt like I wanted to be sure that if I had to leave money on the table, that's okay. And I, and I tell the kids in my office, for Christ's sakes, you'll make more character by leaving a few mm -hmm. bucks on the right. table than trying to get the last nickel out of the deal. So you gotta have a perspective, but I, I can't think of anything more precious. I, the only thing of any value I'm leaving my sons, hopefully, is my reputation. Nothing else matters. There's a lot of rich people out there. You hold your nose when you mention their name. I, I, I think they're a loser. I think they're very poor. So, what else, boys? How, how do you feel in line with that? It's kind of related to ethics, but indirectly. You've been on a lot of corporate boards. Yep. How do you feel about governance in this country and around the world, and what, what do we need to fix that? I mean, I think governance is a lot of crap. People, a lot of people are afraid to bring a Kenny Lane going no, on, no, on the board. Oh, yeah, you know why? Well, let me tell you something right now. This governance shtick has gone too far. I'll give you a specific for mm -hmm. instance today. I co-founded the company in North Carolina 43 years ago. And we put a guy in, when my partner retired, he since died, we put a guy in and he was a disaster. But he had the board in his pocket. I finally had to threaten him. He lost $400 million in five years. And when we threw him out, and I, how do I throw him out? I went to the board and I said, guys, I got some news for you. Tomorrow morning at 9.30, I'm announcing I'm starting a proxy fight. Because like every board meeting I'd go to, I'd raise my hand and i said, this guy should be fired. He's doing a lousy job. And of course, I was a lone voice. I got tired of being alone. I got very lonely and it, I, I really began to get bothered. So I went in and I said, what can I do? And the, my, part, my other partner here in New York said, Michael Solomon, you may know right. him, he used to be a Lazard. Sure. He said, well, you can start a proxy fight. I said, what the hell am I going to do? I'm 73, 74, what the hell? You got to do it because all these people that invested in that company invested because of you. So I go in with a, a copy of a press release I'm going to make and I said to these six other directors, it was always a 6-1 vote. And I stopped going to the board dinners the night before because I felt like a skunk, skunk at a lawn party. So, so I finally said, here's the thing, and tomorrow morning at 9.30, I'm announcing I'm going to solicit proxies to throw you guys out, and then I'll fire the guy myself. They came back to me the next day, long story short, they said, well, we fired him, we gave him a severance package, and we all quit. And I said, Jesus, if I'd have known I could have gotten this much, I'd have given you guys bonuses because of which. <laughs> and the company had $300 million in debt and had one foot in the grave. A year ago right now, the stock was at around nine or $10 a share. Mm. Today, it's at $23 a share. But when we took over, it was at 67 cents a share. It had 60 million shares outstanding. I reverse split it one for three. So it has $2 a share. It's $2 to 23 in six or seven years. Mm -hmm. I bought over almost $10 million worth of stock, so I put my money where my mouth is. Right. And I'm glad I did because my average cost is about nine and a half. Anyway, I got notified yesterday that ISS is voting, is recommending a vote against me to be continued as a director because we can only guess, my, we, we, we have now started to buy the stock back for the company. And my firm charges two cents a share to buy the stock back, which is as competitive as you can be. Right. And because the fiscal year ended June 30th, because the commissions were more than $10,000 in total, I'm no longer an unaffiliated person. Sure. <clears throat> How much more it was than 10,000? It was $893 more than $10,000. Now, I'm, I'm thrilled. I love a fight. Boy, boy, do I love a fight. And I'm, I'm acting, and by the way, 
You only win when you think you're losing and you work like hell to win. Mm -hmm. I'm calling every single stockholder I know and saying, okay, you know where we were, you know where we are. Are you happy? And I just two calls tonight, and I'm going to go out and I'm, I'm going to get the votes. And what about governance? Let me tell you about governance. <clears throat> we're on our way to being the best governed corporate environment mm -hmm. and worst managed. Who do I want sitting in a room? I don't care who they are or what they are. I don't care about whether they're a boy or a girl. I don't care if they're black or white. Latin. I don't care. I want the best people in the room. Anybody want to guess why do you, who wants to take a shot at why you buy a stock? Who wants to tell me that? Who want to tell me? Why do you buy a stock? Nobody knows? The future of the company. What? The future of the company. No, forget the future. No, no, I'll give you a crystal ball. You got the future. You want it to go up. Right? You want to make money. Is that a sin? You, I don't know of anybody. I'm going to buy a stock because I want it to go down. <laughs> Think about it. Who do you want? You want people that when you're talking about sales and strategy and profits and cost cutting and all those things, their heart's beating fast. And I also want people who are at risk. We, Home Depot made the best decisions it made for one reason. We watched that stock. Bernie and Arthur, well, it's, it's, it's known now, we're, you know, we all have a lot of stock, and, you know, <laughs> if Forbes is right. Some of you all, own football teams, for, too, I Forbes, know. Well, Arthur owns a football team, Bernie's got a, Bernie's got a big fish tank down big in Atlanta. Big fish tank. Big and, fish tank. And I got this place up north where they stuck my name all over it, right. so, you know, we all did okay. But I want people, people buy the stock because they expect we're going to make the right decisions. This is not a social instrument. This, this, is, this is not a place for poets and professors and politicians. <laughs> and I'll tell you something interesting. I'll give you a for instance. We'll name the company. It was a, one of the major corporations in America. It was on its board. And one day, I'm in the room. Now, by the way, I, my policy is I won't go on a corporate board unless I want to invest $5 million in the stock. That gets my attention. And when I was invited onto the YUM board in 1997, I bought $5 million worth of YUM stock, and I'm glad I did because it's gone up 16 or 17 fold. And no stock has done better than that. But back to this other board I wanted, it wasn't YUM. So the guy makes his presentation, the CEO, I said, excuse me, I don't get it. What do you mean? I said, well, you're doing this, I, I don't understand it. Well, I'll go over it again. He goes over it again. I said, I still don't get it. Now, he's ducking me, I know he's ducking me. And finally, after two or three times, he breaks down. And he comes out with some of that. I said, wait a minute, you can't do that. You can't, this is not good business. And so you could sense the board was now a little uneasy, and yet they, the thing had been exposed. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, why don't we table it, and we'll bring it up at the next board. I said, that's fine. By the way, we never heard about it again. And after the meeting, two other directors came to me. Mm -hmm and said to me, boy, am I glad you asked those questions because we didn't understand it either. And I said, well, why the hell didn't you raise your hand and say I don't understand it? And one guy blurts out, by the way, a prominent guy, not very bright, but prominent. <laughs> and he says to me, well, I, I didn't want to look like I didn't know it. Right. <clears throat> I said, you ought to resign from this board. You have no right to be on this board. There's thousands upon thousands of people out there that are betting on us, representing them, and protecting their interest. So what about governance? Look, did, did, were there a lot of excesses? Yes, there were. By the way, who's heard of Charles Elson? Ever heard of Charlie Elson? Charlie Elson is the head of the Weinberg, uh, whatever the hell they call it, of Corporate Governance, Institute right. of Corporate Governance mm -hmm. at the University of Delaware. Now, Charlie doesn't like me to bring this up, which is okay with me. Uh, he was on the board of something called uh, Chainsaw Al. What the hell right. was that? Sunbeam Corporation. Sunbeam Corporation. This guy looted the company, and yep. Charlie Elson was on the board the whole time. I said, Charlie, what the hell were you doing while this was going on? And now he's, this, this is a great country. Great country. You know, you flop and you go out and you become an expert and people pay you a lot of money to tell them what you didn't know how to do. <laughs> okay, think about it. So I'm, I'm very short with, look, 
What's the right thing on governance? You make sure people are paid right. You make sure they earn it. You make sure the company does everything to the spirit of the law as well as the letter of the law. You have no secrets. You have no special deals. You don't allow people to take advantage of the company. And you ask yourself the question, if I could put all the owners in a room at one time, what likely would they do if they were here? Because that's what, you can't have, when I was on the GE board, you couldn't have millions of stockholders in a room for a meeting every eight weeks. Couldn't do it. So that's how it works. But it's all predicated on success. It's all predicated on doing the right thing for the owners. That's the fiduciary duty. And this business about stakeholders, my foot. If a company blows up, the losers are the owners. With all due respect to the customers, and by the way, in the case of Home Depot, everything was in alignment. If we took good care of our people in our stores, we took good care of our owners. And by the way, every one of those people were owners. Every employee that ever came to Home Depot immediately was made a stockholder and had a chance for RSUs and options. And in fact, mm -hmm. I'll tell you what the thing I'm proudest of about Home Depot, think of this, this is capitalism. We have 3,000 kids today. I call them kids. If you're under 78, you're a kid. I'm 78 years <laughs> old. I'm 78 years old. We have 3,000 kids today that started working in our lots. These are the kids that push the carts in, and they also help you load your car up. 3,000 that are multimillionaires. 3,000 of them wow. that never went to college. 18, 19 year old kids we hired. I had a kid, I had a young kid, he's now a district manager out of Long Island, he called me just about well, in January this year, so nine months ago, called me up, said to Pam, I gotta see Ken, I gotta see Ken, it's very important. So Pam says he wants to see her, Rick wants to see her, bring him in. So the next day he comes in, and he sits down and he said, I, he said, I have to tell you something. He said, I'm with the company 19 years. He said, uh, last May I paid off my parents' mortgage on their house. This kid didn't go to, he was no college, no nothing. Uh, he said, November I paid off the mortgage on my home. And I just want you to know, I got a call from my broker at Merrill Lynch yesterday that my account's worth more than a million dollars. So he said, now I can say I'm really a millionaire. Huh. And that's what he came in to tell me. It doesn't get any better than that. That's capitalism working. That's how it's supposed to work. And those kids out there, you want to know why we have such wonderful experiences with these kids in the stores? It's because they think they own the place. I had a kid one day, I saw him in the Jericho store. We used to, on the aprons, one of the taglines we had, hi, I'm a Home Depot stockholder. How can I help you? And a guy came up to this kid and said to this kid, is this your department? He said, no, sir. He said, I'm a stockholder. I own a whole store. What can I do to help you? <laughs> it's ownership. You take care of what you own. You respect what you own. This is not what you're learning in these buildings. This is psychology. This is how do you motivate people to do what you want, what a great leader does is he gets people to do so much more than they thought they could do. That's inspiring, that's how you get people to say, boy, am I glad I'm on this team. So when you talk about all this governance crap, right. this is nonsense. Where do you get your leaders from though, Kenny? Are they born or do you? Look, a lot of it's born, but a lot of it is latent. A lot of it, I, I'll give you a for instance. I just got this picture today. The guy by the name of Joe McFarlane. Joe McFarlane was in the Marine Corps. And 20 years ago, he, was, he got mustered out of the Marines at Camp Pendleton, California, and he married a girl who lived near the base. And he was living with her parents once he got out of the Marine Corps. And one morning, he went down to breakfast. And next to the box of kicks or Wheaties, whatever the hell he was having for breakfast, was the mother-in-law, I guess she was getting a little testy about having him around the house. She had cut out an ad that we had run looking for people to go to work in this new store we opened in um, Colmer, no, Colmer's up north, uh, uh, Costa, whatever the hell it was. Uh, anyway, so she said, uh, Joe, she said, uh, why don't you go? Ready? He's today, he started out as an $11.25 associate. He's today the president, he's the president of the Western Division, 700 stores, and he did a wonderful thing for, I could, I could get a little teary, but, he brought his whole team. 
to New York about two months ago to have lunch with me. Now, when you got that kind of spirit in a company, it goes beyond the balance sheet and it goes beyond the income statement and it goes beyond the EBITDA. It's all about driving your people to do so much more than they thought they could do on their own. <clears throat> And there's not enough of that. And this, this crap, this, pardon me, you can quote me, I, this governance nonsense is nonsense. It's nonsense. The, the, these people that sit on these boards that don't know a stock, don't know a, a, a hammer from a saw, what do they do? When you're talking about the environment and you're talking about governance and you're talking about social issues, they're alert and they're awake and they're diving in. But when you start talking about cost and market share and profits and growth, they glaze over. Guess what? Only successful companies can be socially conscious, can give back to the communities. Kmart can't do what we did. By the way, Kmart put through $2 billion to be in the home center business called Builder Square. I remember that. And we kicked their ass from one end of Manhattan to the other. <laughs> we loved it. It's a technical finance term. No, no, get, get, but, <laughs> but, but guess, guess what? You can't do good if you don't have it, the, the wherewithal to do good. I'll tell you, I, I don't mean to get off on Home Depot, but I am going to get off. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a night I'm embarrassed of, and at the same time I was proud of. Not for me, I was embarrassed for what I didn't do, but I was so proud of what somebody else did. When I was on the GE board, when I'm on any board, I only buy their products, even if it's inferior. So I'm on the GE board, what do I do? I only watch NBC, because GE owned NBC. <laughs> That's all. Anybody, I came in the house, anybody's got some other station on, I turn it to Channel 4, and then I say, you can watch all you want on Channel 4. <laughs> you know, if you get it, it brings you to the dance, right? So anyway, one night, I don't know what the hell I'm doing, I get to the apartment, and on Channel 7, there was a reporter by the name of Arnold Diaz. Oh, sure. And he had something, he had a feature called Wall of Shame. And what he did on there, he had... Uh, a piece about a, 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 a bunch of shysters, this man with eight children. The oldest kid was about 13. He lived out in Long Island. His house burned down, and this insurance adjuster, whatever the hell he was, came and said, if you give me the money for the insurance, I'll rebuild your house. And Arnold Diaz has this man with his wife and his children. They're living in a 48, this is November. This is just before Thanksgiving. They're living in a 48-foot trailer with no lights and no water and no heat. And this man said that the guy took the money and he put a few two by fours up and came back and said, I've run out of money, that's all I can do. So Arnold Diaz was featuring this company that ripped them off. Beware of these guys. Uh, I'm, believe me, I'm, I'm devoted to Channel 4. I'm watching, now this to me, pardon me, I am spiritual, this is an act of God. About three and a half or four months later, I'm watching, what am I watching? Channel 7, again. And now, here is this man with Arnold Diaz in front of this house. And in the background, I see something and I can't believe, I, I see all these people with orange aprons on. And they're scurrying around. I went to sleep the night of that story, and I'm, a, I'm ashamed of myself. But one kid that worked for us out in Long Island, the next day went to the store manager and said, we've got carpenters and plumbers and electricians and spacklers, and if I can put together the team to devote, to volunteer their services, will you help us with the materials to rebuild this house? And this man is there with his family, big man, and and Diaz said, well, what do you think? And he said, you know, he said, I've always believed in God, but I didn't know he wore an orange apron. <laughs> That's great. Okay? So I was proud, for, but this is, what, this is what business is capable of. Business is not bad. Business is good. People are bad. The people at Enron were bad. Right. Enron was a company. Unfortunately, it was run by bad people. But this nonsense of, of uh, 
Stan Druckenmiller was on, the, and this, this is like, he's like my fourth son. I love him like a, I take a bullet for him. That's how much I love him. Uh, and he's very successful, by the way. And he gave, by the way, uh, and this had nothing, he, he did, he and his wife gave the medical center $150 million to start the Druckenmiller Neuroscience Institute. And he was a poor kid in Pittsburgh when I know, wonderful guy. Anyway, he's having a debate one afternoon on television with, uh, Phil Angelides, the genius that runs CalPERS. Right. He used to, he didn't do it anymore. So he's going on back and forth about corporate governance and this and that and the other. And finally Stanley says, excuse me, sir. He said, can you tell me what your rate of return of your funds were in the last 10 years? Well, I, I don't, I'm not sure. And Stanley said, well, I can tell you what it was. It was one and a half percent a year. Why are all these state funds in trouble? Think about it. Right. They're all going broke. Why? They made promises and the rates of return are nowhere near what they need to be for solvency. And why? Oh, because they're using these investments as instruments of social change or, or social responsibility. If Spitzer had won as controller of the city of New York, oh, he, would have been a, he would have been an activist for every single stock in that portfolio. A headline a day, Honeywell, General Electric, Home Depot, oh, he would he would he would have had a field day with me like you wouldn't believe. That's why he wanted the job. That's why he wanted the job. Yeah. For headlines. That's had the real reason he wanted anyway, the job. Anyway, go ahead, Charlie. Yeah. Uh, we have a few minutes left, so I'll have to control him on this one because I, I know that I have Mount Vesuvius next to me on this topic, God. having watched him two weeks ago. Ken, Ken doesn't cash his Social Security checks. He gives them away to charities. Why do you do that, Ken? Well, first of all, other than professors, who's 50 years old in this room? No, no, other than professors. You don't count. Bob, Bob, we're over here. Okay. I want to thank all of you for allowing me to take your money every month and give it to my charity. I, I give my check. They started the program at Home Depot called Ken's Kids, and it's now Ken's Crew. These are children. They're no children. They're now adults, many of them. These are challenged. These are autism. These are Down syndrome. And, and it's a very expensive program. We hire coaches to help these kids get into a routine. Now, some of them can work two hours a week. Some of them can work 40 hours a week. And uh, my, wife, my wife gives host to the Boys Club in New York. She's on the board of the Boys Club in New York. All that does is cost me money. Because every time they need something new, she comes home and says, we just did this. And I say, boy, she knows more about my finances than I do because I'm sure she thinks the check is going to clear. Well, it always does. But anyway, <laughs> Home Depot, I send my check every month to Ken's crew. And that's used to pay for the coaches to be with these kids. And we now have 120. And in fact, Fairway Markets is going to do it. Mm -hmm. CVS has started to do it. Mm -hmm. So we're all, we're all, we're out there reaching to give these kids. And by the way, think of the kid. And this came about because one of my partners has a child that has Down syndrome. And he came and says, with this idea, and I said, let's see if we can do it. And so I went down and I saw Bob Nardelli and, and Frank Blake, and I said, uh, this is something we want to do. And uh, we did it. And just think of this kid. He was sitting at home, and by the way, they have a tendency to gain weight. Think of the kid that gets a check now, and it's his, and he earned it. You talk about a sense of worth and a sense of purpose. So. There's an example of, but, but what you brought up, when are you people going to wake? You're worried about the environment. You're worried about all these things. When are you going to wake up and realize, I'm screwing you. I'm, I'm, doing a, I'm taking money out of your pocket. I will get $300,000 a year more from the government than I gave to the government. And Bob, so will you. And all of you. And worse, your children who haven't been born yet mm -hmm. are going to give the government $400,000 more than they get. This is generational theft. I shouldn't get. Here I'm talking about giving money here and doing this, and I'm getting a check. I, my wife and I get almost $4,300 a month. What's going on? He's referring to a Social Security yeah, check. what the <clears> hell's <throat> going on? But you're letting it happen. And why does it happen? It's easy. These guys in Washington are care about one thing, getting reelected. So when AARP calls up and says, we want more, don't get those old geezers wound up because they'll, they'll gang up on you. OK? 
As long as they only hear from the one side, they figure they got a no-fail bet. Give them what they want because there's no counteraction. Stanley and I, I'm doing Lehigh, uh, I think we're doing Lehigh in two weeks. Stanley did, he packed the house at Ber this bastion of liberalism, he packed the house at Berkeley. He did it at USC, we're gonna do it at uh, Johns Hopkins, he did it at Bowdoin, we did it here. We're gonna do it at my alma mater, Bucknell. You kids, and you are kids, you got to understand you're being ripped off. How long does it take for you to wake up, stop the nonsense about the certain special beetle that's being extinguished or, you know, some bug that we never saw or heard of? <laughs> that's all important. But what's going to be in the larder for you when you're my age? You're, you will be a senior one day. You will be where I am, my age. What are you doing about it? AARP? Sorry, American Association of Retired Pigs. They never have enough. I asked a man one night, I, I live in a gated community in Florida and there are all these retired CEOs and whenever I want to get a little action. <laughs> Though they must love now, when you pull these guys are in. all retired CEOs <laughs> of major corporations. I'm telling you, this is, this is heavy duty stuff. And they've all got their pensions and all the goodies and so forth. And whenever I want to get a rise, I'll walk into the card room and say, Jesus, I just heard I got a call from a guy in Washington. Uh, they're going to uh, uh, do means testing on people for Social Security. The goddamn cards go up in the air and they start screaming. <laughs> it's my money. All I'm doing is getting my money back. Stop it. I ask them two things. I say to them, if you buy fire insurance on your house, the best thing that could happen to you is not to put a claim in. Best thing. Right. You've handed the risk off. And thank God you didn't need it. Now, at the end of the year, if you didn't have a fire, do you get the premium back? I don't think so. Why not consider a Social Security unemployment insurance just that? If you don't win like I won, you get it. Right. If you win like I won, you don't get it. And the other thing I ask him is a lot of these old guys, and this is a showstopper. I say, hey, listen, you and your grandson are on an island. You're marooned. You got a little bag of food. You got one meal left. Do you eat it? Do you give it to your grandchild? Oh, I give it to my grandchild. Hey, that's very interesting because you're stealing from your grandchildren right now and you think nothing of it. You're putting them in a hole. Please, please, please. You got to get involved. You, you, look, you're bright people. You're young. This is, there's nothing in this for me. Well, for guys like me, it's all about Fairness, and it's all about some of you aren't going to, no matter how hard you work, you aren't going to win. And that's okay. There should be a safety net to allow you to live in your old age and dignity and with food and heat mm -hmm. and so forth. That's what it should be about. But I, get a, I leave here, I get on my Global Express, I fly someplace, I go to one of my magnificent homes, I got a driver down. You're giving me $3,300 a month. For what? And you're not, you're not doing anything about it. Is anybody getting pissed off while I talk this way? <laughs> no, seriously. Raise your hands if you're getting angry. Please. Right. All right. What he are you wants gonna, you to get angry. What are you going to do about it? Right. There's nothing in this for me. More importantly, it's not about you. It's about that grandchild that you're going to have that hasn't been born yet. What about him or her? We're at our best when we have our back to the wall. These entitlements are a nightmare. Guys, I shouldn't get Medicaid or Medicare. I shouldn't, get, I shouldn't get a damn thing from the government. I won big, huge. Make it easy. Get the fat cats first. I say, you know, take us out. Take us out of the equation. But if you don't start getting involved and calling up your congressman, what the hell's going on? What are you doing? You don't do that, they're not going to do, all they're going to hear, do here is from these old geezers that want more. And they say, well, I'll get reelected, just give them what they want. Here's how lopsided the world is. When I had three kids and we were struggling, I go to a movie on a Saturday. It put a hit to the family budget. I go every place down, I get everything for nothing. I go to a movie house, I get a discount. <laughs> it's kind of, what's, this is upside down. <laughs> it's a guy with three kids on a rainy Saturday afternoon that's got to spend 35 or 40 bucks to take his kids to a movie and get some popcorn. That's where the break should be. I'm at the end of the trail, or close to it, I hope.
Not too close, I mean, you know. <laughs> Not yet. Go ahead. Not yet. The last, anyway, last question. Please, you've got to get involved. We'll, we'll, we'll put up a link of that meeting that was here for 90 minutes two weeks ago, which is spectacular. I watched it last weekend, and, and it should be mandatory for all of you. It's Druck and Miller. It's a guy named Joffrey Church who's spectacular. And it's, and it's Ken. Jeff uh, Cap. Jeff Cap, yes. Jeff Cap. With, a, with a moderator, and it is, it, it is spectacular in terms of understanding in more mathematical detail exactly what he's talking about. You're going to lose $800,000 over your life if you don't do something, basically, is what's going to happen, period, full stop, because of the numbers. This is horrible. So he's on a campaign for you this wanna, now. You last last question, last question, of, last question. And then we'll open it up to the floor yeah, for a few questions. Yeah, we'll ask a couple of questions. All right. I got no place to go to Monday morning, so you know what. To compliment the hell. Mr. Langone, and it's, he's already told you that he turns—he actually turned 78 d during this session two weeks ago on the stage, which yeah. I was greatly impressed right. with. The other thing that he said, which I, I wouldn't—I would be remiss if I didn't say at this gathering—is he had been married to the same woman since he was a senior in college. All right, how did you do that? And how did you balance the family life thing? I get asked that all the time by my she students. She was young enough and innocent enough not to realize what a mistake she was making. So, <laughs> so I figured I better take advantage of the situation because when she became more mature, she'd figure out this was a bad luck. This is all about luck. It's all about luck. You have two kids. Your hormones are flying around. You're in love. You want to get married? We didn't. We, pardon me. We, we didn't live together then. You had to get married, you know, and not had to, but you did get married. And you know, people grow apart or people grow closer. And 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 a big event for us is to go downstairs in the screening room I have and watch a movie on mm -hmm. a Saturday night, and maybe go up to this little pizza parlor in Port Washington and yeah. have a pizza and a bowl of pasta, you know. The thing I like to think about that is this is affordable for everybody. Not the screening room, but you can go get a movie. <laughs> but you know, the pizza and, and, and so, and by the way, she knows I'm nuts. And she understands it and she accepts it. Like I told her, you know, like, I'm not gonna be home late till late Friday night and it's okay. We grew, we grew closer over 57 years. We literally grew closer over 57 years, and we enjoy each other, but this, this doesn't happen all the time. I think of the number of people over the years I've known that we've grown apart. I'm, going, I'm having my 60th high school reunion in two weeks, and I'm going to it, and people in business said, well, what the hell are you doing that for? I said, well, these are all people that were all like me as a kid growing up, and many of them didn't do as good as I did, but they were great friends, and I always enjoyed their company, and I can't wait to see Billy Sherman and Donald Campbell and Chuck Gage and Chuck Skidmore. I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with just being who you are. And, well, and my marriage was truly uh, a tribute to her patience and understanding and forgiveness. I mean, I, I, I'm almost sound like I'm describing the, uh, 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 Mary, the mother of Jesus, but. Well, but she comes close, but it worked. And you know, we're still nuts about each other. We still love each other That's very great. much. And we have fun together. That's fantastic. Okay? Good for you. Here, here. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I give. <laughs> oh boy, Kenny. So, <clears throat> how about a few questions from the floor? I want to just leave it with one thought before I answer some questions. Try to live your dreams. Dream big and try to live your dreams. And if you don't, it's okay. But keep trying. That's critical. That's what made America the great country it is. And by the way, we are and we will always be the greatest nation on earth. And incidentally, one more thought. My grandparents came from Italy. My grandfather, when he died at 72, still couldn't read or write. He left school when he was six years old. And he had a shovel. I've got a picture of him in my office. And if I show you his hand, it's gnarled because he had a shovel in his hand for the time he was six years old until the, actually the day he died. He had a stroke and died while he was working at 72. And I, when I put this pen on every day, I always, and I say it, because if you heard me, you say that he's nuts, there's nobody in the closet, he's talking to himself. I always say, Grandma and Grandpa, thanks for coming to America. This is truly the greatest nation on earth, and we'll get through this rough patch, we'll make it. And largely because of young people like you that have a burning desire to win and succeed, 
and you're here at night and you're, you're making sacrifices to do what you're doing, and that's great. But don't, don't ever sell this country short. We're the very best, so live your dream. All right, now some questions. Some questions. What's the format? Should they stand up by the mic? Do whatever they want. Go ahead, Avi. You want to fight? Oh, no, no. I don't want to fight you. <laughs> First of all, happy belated birthday. Uh, thanks for coming to uh, speak Thank to you. us. Very inspirational. Uh, specifically about corporate governance, I know you said it's crap, but one more thing I want to ask you, yeah. specifically about this issue that's been uh, in the news the last few months about splitting up the chairman and CEO, so that I don't want to get you started again, but that the chairman would be independent with his, with his or her directors and the CEO can run a company. What's your opinion on that? My opinion, go to Europe. They've had split titles forever. They're on their ass, okay? There isn't an American company that can't whip any one of them over there, all right? It's nonsense. All you need, I tell people this, I don't need any authority on a corporate board. I don't need any at all. And I'll give you a quick story. Because of the Home Depot success, a guy who ran a big retail company called me and said he wanted to come see me. And he said, okay, I said, okay. And he said, I'd like to have you come on my board. And I said, well, let's talk a little bit. And we talked, and I said, now, let me ask you a question. I said, do you have enough self-confidence to have me on your board knowing that if I think you're doing a bad job, I'll be polite, I'll go to you first, but then I'm gonna go into the room, and I'm gonna to say to the board, I wanna raise my hand, he should be fired, he's doing a bad job. <laughs> no, not you, no, 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 you're a nice guy, no, no. And you got a beautiful wife, come on, give me a break, all right? So, I never heard from him again. All you need is one big mouth on a board, and you'll start something, okay? But it takes courage. The thing that board members lack most of all, they all, they all want to be in, they all want to play golf with each other. They all want to be accepted. They all want to go to the board <clears throat> dinner. Uh, I'm on his board, he's on my board, and all that nonsense. David Novak paid me the greatest compliment in the world. And David, David is the head of young brands, and he's done an incredible job. And one time he said to somebody, he said, you know why I like Ken on my board? Because I know if I do a bad job, he'll walk in and say, David should be fired. You think about that incentive. You know, everybody answers to somebody. What happens where the breakdown in corporate governance is, too many, and let's talk about the, a guy that's a poet, poetry teacher at Bucknell, making 85 or 90 grand. Now he ends up being a board member of some company. His annual fees are not unusual, $250,000 a year. He's being paid three times what he's making for showing up once every three months. He ain't going to rock that boat. He ain't going to do it. This nonsense, they're independent, is nonsense. I was on a board where I was working like hell to try and help them fix it. And one of the directors who was put on the board by the previous chairman I called the previous chairman, I said, look, you gotta do something. We got a mess here and I can't get any help. He called that guy up and he said to the guy, look, what are you doing? Why aren't you, why aren't you getting more aggressive? And he said, sir, he said, I called the guy, my partner was named Pete, but it wasn't Pete. He says, Pete, I need the money. Mm. And that was only a $70,000 a year fee. You're paying corporate board members 280, 300. Go look at what they're being paid. Mm. They're not independent anymore. They can't be. And they can tell you they aren't. Don't kid yourself. They ain't gonna kill the goose that lays the golden egg. So if I'm skeptical or cynical, I am. Yes, sir. Let's just say you're opinionated is the better way to say it. How's that? Well, I, look, I'm trying to come out of my shell. It isn't easy, but I'm working I like know, hell. <laughs> I'm seeing a shrink twice well, a week, but it's not helping. For you, I can see yes, that. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you very much for coming. And uh, I'm happy to be here. Yeah. I'm, uh, this has a special place in my life because, by the way, this program being number one in the, I, I, I'm a very competitive dog, and I, I have to win. You know, sure. winning, winning for me is what air and water is to a lot of other people. So by what these professors, Bob and you and your team, have done here, and all of you as students, you have no idea the joy I get from being able to say that, that, and the reason I did it was I was afraid they were going to end the night program like they did at the law school. And George Daly was then the dean and he yep. came and saw me. I said, George, I'm really worried. 
He said, well, would you give us some money? And I said, well, tell me what it'll get me. He said, well, we'll guarantee you we'll keep the program going. Now, by the way, all the business schools are starting part-time programs. And I'm, just keep it up. Being number one, where I came from, get second place gets you nothing, OK? Yes, sir. Yeah, thanks again. And um, yeah, I appreciated your soliloquy about your wife, because my wife actually was the reason that I'm doing the program right now. So. Um, I was wondering about your thoughts about public service because right now the debt ceiling debate is getting really ugly and I guess at risk of stirring Vesuvius again. How do you feel about the debt ceiling debate and do you think it's appropriate or like when do you feel it's appropriate for business people to go into Well, public let me service? tell you what I think the Republican Party ought to do. And I conveyed this to two very high-ranking people in Congress this week. There's a Vitter Amendment. I think we ought to say that all the congressmen and their staffs have to be subjected to the same requirements of Obamacare, and we're going to give you a continuing resolution without equivocation, and we're going to increase the debt limit, and the president said he's going to sit and negotiate with us. All we want is at the end of every negotiation session, we want a summary to the media of what was talked about, who wants what, and let them, so the world knows that no more of these closet deals. So how do I, let me tell you about public service. We don't bring the best people in America to public right. service. And for good reason. For lack of a better word, it's a cesspool. Think of the, think of the approval rating of people, what's it, 11% in Congress? Doesn't that tell you something? I, I would have no trouble going into public service, except I don't want to have to lie. I can't get in front of two totally disparate groups of people and tell one one thing and one the other thing to get their votes, and that's what happens. That's what goes on. We are the problem. We all want what we want from our government. And sometimes what each of us want conflicts with what the other person wants. I think it's tragic. I think it's tragic that we, we're not attracting the best and the brightest to public service. Yeah. I think we're going to pay a terrible price for it. But on the other hand, who would want to run, and pardon me, I mean no offense, who would want to run against an Elliot Spitzer or a, a, what the hell was Wiener's name, first name? The guy that got caught taking dirty pictures of himself. <laughs> what the hell was his name? Anthony Wiener. Huh? Anthony Wiener. Anthony Wiener. And at one point, these guys were leading in their races. What's going on? And where's our sense of self-respect? Where's our sense of example for our children? Look at this horrible thing that happened up on the West Side Highway last week, yep. where they literally commandeered one of the major highways in New York. And now the cops and prosecutors are fighting about whether they should bring charges against them. And you got the video showing how they smashed the windows. Look, we're going to pay a terrible price. But back to your question, I don't know of anybody I know who would want to go into public service because, first of all, in too many instances, it's all about what they can get out of it. It's all about getting reelected. I mean, and let me go against myself. We had this horrible hit last year at the medical center, over a billion dollars in damage. I think Chuck. Schumer's politics are horrible. But I just ran a fundraiser for him, and we raised 300 grand. Why? Because in our hour of need, Chuck Schumer pulled every single lever in government that he could to help us get back on our feet. That's public service at its best. At its best. So I have to be real and honest and say, Chuck, and I told him to his face, I said, you know, Senator, no, that's not, in fact, when I introduced him at the fundraiser, I said, yeah, you can take a picture and you can tell people it was no prop. I'm standing next to him. Standing next to Ken Lego. I think his politics suck, <laughs> but he's a great human being. And by the way, when he sent me a note back with two glasses from the Senate, what the hell am I going to do with two glasses from the Senate? <laughs> he said, and to quote somebody else, your politics suck, but you're a nice guy. And his note to me. Uh, look, we've got to figure a way out to bring the best back. All of us, all of us. I, I, the greatest thing I'm most, the thing I'm proudest of is I served my nation twice in the military. One time I did it voluntarily. The second time when they built a wall around Berlin, right in the middle of my, beginning of my career, I was called back, sent to Fort Bragg, 
because Khrushchev had built a wall around Berlin and we were getting ready to go to war. But I gotta tell you, one of the biggest mistakes we made as a nation was doing away with the draft. I'm sorry. There ought to be some requirement of public service on the part of each and every American, each and every citizen. Whether you go into the public health service, whether you go into the national forum, whatever it is, there ought to be a requirement that every, you, you know, you look at Israel. Right. Israel survives. Think about the odds against Israel. It survives because of its will to win and its will to survive. And every kid, you go, I left Israel one night at midnight, and uh, there's a beautiful girl in the army uniform, and she wanted to know what I do with my suitcase that day, and I told her I left it with a bellhop at the uh, King David Hotel, and she said, well, I'm sorry, sir. She made me take everything out. Fortunately, there was nothing embarrassing. Anyway, even my underwear was clean, so I didn't, you know. <laughs> My mother used to tell me, make, make That's sure you exactly remember. Right. remember. In case you go to the hospital. In case you have an accident, make sure you got clean underwear on, right. okay? <clears throat> and, or the other one was, you gotta finish your food because all these people in the world are starving. I don't know how my finishing all this food is gonna help those people, but, <laughs> right? Very true. Anyway, what I'm saying One or two more is, questions, please. We gotta figure a way out to get people, good people, to wanna go in public service. One more, no more? I can go home to my bride. One more? Uno one more, last one. One more, come on, make it tough. Last one and then we'll Price, have a you're cocktail. Throwing, you're throwing softballs at me. Um, well, thank you again for coming. Thank you for having me. And um, my question kind of about what you were talking about in terms of the psychology of working at Home Depot and the way that you got employees who are really loyal. Um, the discussion people have been having recently about how CEOs are making so many multiples of what their line employees are making, do you think that that's a situation of I mean, do you think that what the CEO is getting made is really the problem, or that those companies oh, are just flawed and This is a hand grenade. Here we go. <laughs> are, there, are there chief executives overpaid? Yes. But I will tell you right now, I couldn't pay Frank Blake, he's now the CEO of Home Depot, I couldn't pay him enough if I paid him 10 times what he's making right now, what he's done with this company. Our, our market cap has gone up $80 billion. It's gone from roughly $30 billion to over $115 billion. That's his leadership. And by the way, the key is to offer everybody yeah. the chance right. to succeed. But this, we aren't, business is not an instrument of social change. You, I buy a stock in a, one of my companies just got acquired last week, Mako Surgical. I bought the stock because I believed that surgery was going to go more and more robotic. Mm -hmm. And they've got this robotic instrument mm -hmm. to do knees and hips robotically. Now, you go from here to there, but think of the number of companies that were so, look, Kmart was one of the best governed companies in America. Oh, by the way, it went bankrupt. Sam Walton had four Ben Franklin five and dime stores in, in, in Bentonville, Arkansas. And Kmart opened their first, it was called Kresge, they opened their first Kmart yeah. discount store in Troy, Michigan. And Harry Cunningham, who was then the chairman of Kmart, was my neighbor in Florida. I took him to see a Home Depot store one day and he told me that every time he went into that store in Troy, Michigan. Sam Walton was in there. Now, today Walmart is the biggest corporation in the world, and Kmart doesn't exist anymore. They had big, we started with $2 million. I, I tell them the formula for success. A broken down Italian investment banker. <laughs> Two Jews on their way to the slammer because Sandy Sigalov wanted to fire him, and an Irishman who just took bankruptcy, Pat Farah. With $2 billion, we used 10 cups to get the money. They threw $2 billion at the exercise, and we whipped their ass like they were a rented mule, okay? Why? Because of our people. Because we knew how precious they were. We, they needed to know how grateful we were. This nonsense about month, that's, for, you want to go in civil service, you're G1, G2, G18, you want to do that, you get in that ladder. I want that kid, I'll give you one more story, one more vignette, this is a true story. If you take a faucet, you know the handle, you turn it on or off, 
If you take the handle off and you take, and you take the stem out, at the bottom of the stem is a washer. The washer sometimes gets caked and gets, you know, brittle. And that's when you get the drip and the faucet. Well, anyway, this guy, apparently his wife was wake, keeping him awake all night because the faucet was going drip, 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 drip. And the next morning, he goes into a Home Depot store in Elmont. And he says to the kid on the floor, do me a favor, sell me one of these things. I can't take my wife keeping me awake all night long. You could give a damn less about the drip. And the kid says, you don't need to know one of these. What do you mean? He says, well, come on with me. And the kid takes them over to the plumbing section, and there's little bags of washes, 25 cents for a bag. He takes the bag off the, off the peg, tears it open, gets the right screw, unscrews the screw that holds a washer in, takes the old washer out, puts the screw back, puts the, washer, the new washer in, puts the screw in, says, take it home, put it in, it won't drip anymore. Kid took the initiative of opening a 25, and the guy's how much away, the kid says nothing, have a nice day. Two months later, I know the story because the man that did it called me to tell me. I didn't know him. And by the way, every home I have, all the phone numbers are listed. They're so afraid of me, I don't get called to change my cable, I don't get calls to sell insurance, they don't bother me. <laughs> I'm serious, go see, check out, all my homes are listed. <laughs> So this guy calls me up to tell me that he wanted me to know that two months later, his wife said, we need a new kitchen. And she said, I want to go down to one of these fancy foo-foo places where they screw you when they sell you these $100,000 kitchens that are worth 35,000 bucks. He said, oh no, he said, I'm going to my friend at Home Depot. And he goes to the store and he goes to the kid and the kid says, well, I don't work in the, in the kitchen and bath, but I'll take you to somebody. $72,000 kitchen for a two-cent washer. Now, tell, let me tell you something right now. That kid's on a fast track to go someplace because of his initiative. This is what it should be all about. Frank Blake is an inspiring leader. He's a very unique human being. He's a genius leader. He does it right. He should make a lot of money. I hope one day one of those kids that we're hiring to push carts back is Frank Blake. Like, like I told you, Joe McFarland running yeah. 700 stores. Joe, the, what we owe them is not this, this crap, this GS1, GS2 stuff. What we owe them is to say, you do a great job, and you've got a future here, and you can really succeed beyond your wildest dreams. That's capitalism, and that's how it's supposed to work. You want to go in that deal where you've got some balance? Go to the post office. They've got great jobs. They're going broke, but in the meantime, you'll get, you can be sure the postman is not making much more than you. Meanwhile, Federal Express whipped their asses. U UPS did. What's the difference? The difference is you had creative minds running those companies, and you had people over here in the post office that all, thank God for government subsidy, what, $12 billion this yeah, year? Right. Okay. Thanks for having me. Please, please do me a favor. Get involved in your future, not mine. Get involved in addressing the, 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 the unfairness and the, and, the, and the terrible theft, generational theft that's going on. It's coming out of your pocket. I should be responsible for giving my own money away to charity, not yours, and I'm using yours too, and that's wrong. While you're scrimping and saving, you're giving me money for me to give away to a charity that I should give out of my own good fortune. Thanks for having me. I'm proud of every one of you. Whenever I meet a kid that said he went to the Langone program, my chest, my chest goes out. You can't believe it. And, and I'll tell you, I got a better deal. Whatever I gave him, I didn't give him enough. You got more. I got a whole lot more. Thanks, Adam. Time me. for a drink. Thanks, Kenny. That was great. All right, boy. Fantastic.